So I never know what to expect out of these pay-per-views that come from WWE right immediately on the heels of another one, like one to two weeks later. And there's a lot of times you look at it and you say, this is crazy. Why are you doing this type of special show so quickly after the last one? You barely had time to absorb what just happened, what just went down. You've left yourself very minimal television time to build up to it, and then here we go. But the ironic thing was, when you look at this past week, there was actually reason to be really intrigued and really excited about this payback pay-per-view. Not everything on it, and certainly not everything delivered. Uh, but it was better than the average Raw or SmackDown, let's put it that way. Um, it kind of started off slow as a show, though, but I think as the night went along, it did pick up quite a bit of momentum and quite a bit of steam. Not so much, again, at the beginning, though. Like, you look at the U.S. title match, Apollo Crews and Bobby Lashley, and to me, this is just the epitome of what I've talked about for years, about just how messed up the dynamics are of WWE storytelling. And he here's what I mean, is the Hurt Business is a faction, and they're supposed to be a heel faction. Yet it is the babyface Apollo Crews is the guy going it alone, who is also the champion, and the Hurt Business can't seem to get one over on him. So you have the baby face who's going it alone, but instead of having to overcome the obstacles, feels like he is the obstacle. It's just really hard to tell effective stories that way. And while the match itself was, you know, kind of solid for an opener, you look at what happened after the finish. Bobby Lashley wins the United States title, and keep me honest here, but felt like it was pretty clean. Why is Apollo Crews sitting there and throwing a Hogan-like hissy fit? It reminds you of the 92 Royal Rumble where Hogan threw a hissy fit. And he pulled Sid over and helped Flair eliminate Sid because Sid dared to eliminate him in an every-man-for-himself Royal Rumble match. But you're supposed to cheer Hogan in 92? Give me a break! Why would you be cheering Apollo Crews? Why would you want to get behind Apollo Crews? Where not only was he the obstacle that was finally overcome by the Hurt Business, but he acted like a poor sport and a bad loser afterwards. I didn't like the way they were celebrating. Oh. But the whole storytelling dynamics here are just really messed up. And you look at Big E and Sheamus, to me, is another example of, you know, kind of squirrely storytelling dynamics. Now, look, I understand the desire to want to get behind Big E and potentially push him. I certainly think it's him or Keith Lee are the two leaders in the clubhouse right now for the guys that should win the 2021 Royal Rumble. And you could chime in in the comments with your thoughts on whether it should be Big E or Keith Lee. And please don't throw out a bunch of other lame, typical options that you would have. Keep the discussion to those two guys. But it almost feels like it's over course correction. Like I even get the, the back and forth with The Miz, you know, and talking about, you know, are you able to take it seriously enough to be that level of material of world champion. Like, that's a valid storyline to potentially play out. But I just don't know that the dynamics really work here with Sheamus, and the match was kind of plodding and slow. Like, I saw a Raj from Wrestling Inc. was talking about, you forget that Sheamus was once a top guy, and it's like, well, there are reasons for that. And he pointed out something like, well, because he won his first world title at, a, what was it, TLC 2009? I don't think that's it. It's the things like him beating Daniel Bryan in 10 sec 12 sec 18 seconds, whatever it was, as some of the fans point out. It's what I pointed out about the fact that, you know, when he was the champion in 2010, he turned tail and ran and was looking for the breakfast club to help protect him from the nexus when he's supposed to be the heel. Like, they made him look like a bitch. It's those types of things that didn't happen. Sheamus over the years. But you forget that this is a guy that's a multiple-time world champion. So this is the type of match that a biggie should be in that it should be looking to elevate him and help him. And I just don't think he gets anything out of it. And even like afterwards, it felt like they went too far with the Big E addressing the haters and addressing the doubters and talking and smack talking to Corey Graves. It's like, you know, this feels like you're going a little too far in this direction. Unless you were trying to rocket ship him before the Rumble into a world title type of position. Um, slow it down a little bit. Let it simmer a little bit more. Let it simmer a little bit more. Uh, then we got what I thought was easily the most boring match of the night, and that was freaking Matt Riddle and Baron Corbin. And I, I still can't for the life of me understand why people are into this Matt Riddle crap. 
Like maybe this is yeah, boomer fan in me, but I look at him and he's like the epitome of so many things you wouldn't like out of millennials. You know what I mean? But that makes him a perfect heel. Like he's got douchebaggery tendencies on screen and apparently outside of the ring. Go there. You could get a lot more mileage out of it instead of trying to force people to like him on the main roster. And just because the hardcore fans liked him down at the lower levels, which NXT certainly is the lower level, that doesn't mean that that translates at the higher level. Like I'm looking at him more and more, and I'm just thinking of him, and I'm saying, you know, it's almost like he tries to rip off RVD's shtick in so many ways, except RVD was a lot better in a lot of ways. So it just, it just doesn't work. Like I want to call him shitty the damn. And, and, you know, admittedly, I would geek the hell out one time if he came out and said, I'm a silly the damn. That's kind of how he talks anyway. And said, S-T-D. And then he kicked his flip-flops. Yeah. He sucks. His match sucked. Baron Corbin, you argue, sucks. But Baron Corbin's a victim of just a crappy gimmick. That's what he's a victim of. He's a victim of a bad gimmick. He should be a lot better and a lot more important than he is. And it's a shame that they waste him on somebody like shitty the damn. Anyways. Then the last match that I thought was really kind of a clunker, except for the finish, was the Women's Tag Team Championship. Uh, the match action itself, I was not into. I just could not get into this no matter what. Now, the finish was very interesting. The finish was actually kind of badass by Shayna Baszler. Like, that looked really cool. Like, that looked like something that made her feel like she's somebody you should take seriously. Like, there was an appeal there to seeing a finish like that. Like, that was creative and very well done, and it looked good. You know, most importantly, it came across well on TV. So I enjoyed that immensely. I was just really surprised here that they didn't do a turn with Sasha and Bailey. And I'm sure they're building to that eventually. I mean, the story's only been going for 300 damn years. What's well, another month or two, right? Oh, God. Now she's no Banks belt and Bailey's still the SmackDown Women's Champion. Like, oh, gag me already, will you? Just get to the finish line with this. Get it done and over with. Match was really clunky. Finish came across really well. The post-match stuff, you know, I hope Nia's mic skills in other places aren't as bad as her mic skills on camera because they're really, really bad. Really bad. Like, every time they put a live mic in front of her, somebody should be fined $500. That's how bad it is. Like, even the post-match celebration just was really bad. Like, it was really bad. Anyways, um, to me, like, up to this point, I'm like, oh, God, this is kind of a crappy show. But knowing that we potentially had some heavy hitters coming up, you get to Keith Lee and Randy Orton. Yeah, I did the video. Did they really ruin him already when they're putting him in a spot against Orton in his first pay-per-view match is against Orton in a featured spot? Um, do you still think he's buried now? Now, look, I think his theme music is still crap. His ring attire was better this time. I still wasn't a huge fan, but at least he got rid of the basketball skirts. I mean, shorts. It's the same difference. What the hell does it matter? Um, like, it looked a little better. I can live with some of that. It doesn't have to be perfect. And just because it's not exactly what he did down in NXT doesn't automatically mean that that's the bad thing to change it. Um, but again, I could just picture Vince sitting there saying, God damn, pal, gotta cover that guy. Maybe you don't have to. Maybe you don't have to. Uh, but the match was relatively short, which is a pleasant surprise to me. Now you can sit there and say, how does it make Drew McIntyre look? The fact that he had to battle Orton for like 20 minutes and had to beat him with the freaking backslide where here's Keith Lee wins it in what, five or six minutes and hits him with that devastating, good, clean shot of a massive power bomb. It's a fair question, perhaps. But you could also make the argument that in a match like that, I would rather ha not have Keith Lee go 20 minutes or Randy Orton go 20 minutes in the ring against each other. Like, this should be a quicker hitting match, a shorter match that has more high-impact, powerful stuff that gets in, gets out, and accomplishes what it needs to. It's a really good pay-per-view debut for Keith Lee. And Orton being the anti-Cena, actually putting somebody over, you know, and putting him over legitimately. And you don't expect him to sit there and then pull the scene, which is, yeah, I'll lose to a Kevin Owens once, but afterwards he's going to be my bitch. It ain't that type of dance here. Um, 
enjoyed the match, mostly because it was short, and Keith Lee won. Uh, the best pure match of the night, I think, has to be the tag match with the Mysterios taking on Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy. Like This was incredibly well done. There's actual story behind this. There's reason to get emotionally invested. You can actually see these guys, especially Dominic, display emotion. Like Dominic's really impressed me so far. You know, in terms of as an in-ring competitor, as a performer. Like, he feels very natural, almost Dustin Rhodes type in that way. And I hesitate to say that because Dustin is a phenomenal talent. You still see that showing in AEW, even at his age of 50 plus. But Dominic, man, you could tell he grew up in the business. You could tell he just has a natural feel for selling. has a natural feel for timing, for facial expressions, emotions, um, being able to navigate throughout the story. Like, really impressive stuff. Now he's got a long ways to go in terms of character development and being able to talk on a microphone and tell stories in a different way. You know, he's taller than his dad, probably needs to fill out his frame, get some man weight on his body, you know, add 20, 30 pounds, we'll take him to another level. You know, best thing to do, make a couple babies. It's going to put the man weights on you real quick like. Um, this was impressive stuff. I enjoyed the hell out of this match, and it sure seems like a lot of other people enjoyed the hell out of this match, too. It was really, really good. Some people may be ready for them to move on from this. Me, personally, I'm not. They could drag this out a little bit longer. It's very rare we actually got interesting and compelling stories in WWE right now. So when we get a good one, I'm remiss to sit there and bitch about wanting it to end any sooner than it absolutely has to. Like As far as I'm concerned at this point, you got so far along... Like, I damn near say you should drag this out, crap out to Survivor Series and have them have a traditional five-on-five -five tag match or something. Let that be the blow-off. Would that be so bad? Well, that's a couple of months away, but would that be so bad? I'm sure that's not what they're going to do, but would that be so bad? But even that, as great as Dominic was, as good as that tag match was, you get to the main event, and this is all that anybody cared about, because this was all that this show came down to, because... You had the real main event player in there. And we're not talking about The Fiend, and we're not talking about Braun Strowman. We are talking about Roman freaking Reigns. And I loved this match. I loved the way it was set up. I loved the way it was executed. And obviously, I loved the obviously needed result. That Roman Reigns is your new WWE Universal Champion. Or is he WWE champion? Which other? He's a world champion. Bottom line. See, I'm getting old. And that's phenomenal. It's fantastic. Splendiferous. And most importantly of all, kids and adults alike now have a world champion that they can be proud of, that they can believe in, that they can respect, and they can trust. You have a true hero, a true babyface, as your world champion on the SmackDown brand. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. And he sat there and he had used the chair on Braun several times. And he neck shot at Braun Strowman. And he's aligned with Paul Heyman. And he didn't come out to the match until it was about halfway done. And it felt like he took the easy way out. Well, let me tell you something. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. All of your perceptions, your notions, your misconceptions are going to be addressed right here, right now. You tell me what is hateable about Roman Reigns when he did the following things. And it's a significant list of things that are worthy of respect and trust and praise. That's a hero. That's a baby face. He signed the contract without adding any loopholes or anything to it whatsoever. So he said he was going to be there. He showed up, man of his word. Didn't sit there and do any traditional heel tactics of trying to add special stipulations or anything like that. He showed up to the match as promised. He didn't say when. He just said he would be there. And he was. And he signed the contract in order to legally enter and participate in the Triple Threat World title match. He followed the rules of the match. You tell me one rule that he broke. One rule. One rule that he broke. He did it. You can't. Babyface. He brought his own chair in order to save the company money. So even in this spot where he's about to be the man, he's about to be the world champion, he's still thinking about the greater good. 
He brought his own folding chair from Walmart, bought it himself, not even going to expense the company. Like, that is something to love. That is something to admire. He made sure that he kept his manager, Paul Heyman, out of the way. Now, he told Paul, you know what? I got this. I don't need any help. Roman Reigns did not get any help. He kept his manager safe. What's hateable about that? He even made sure, by God, in these tough economic times, that a second referee got a pay-per-view payday. Again, I ask you, what exactly is he about that? And then we get to the whole thing of, well, he kicked the fiend square in the testicles. Number one, did he break the rules of the match? No. Babyface. Number two, did he look out for his friend and co-worker and potentially save him thousands upon thousands of dollars and future child support obligations by kicking him damn square in the testicles? Yes. Again, and trust me on this, babyface maneuver 100% of the way. What is hateable about that? Well, he kept hitting Braun Strowman with the chair repeatedly. Number one, the ring took as much of that abuse as Braun Strowman, so he was looking out for his co-worker. Seems like a respectable, admirable thing to do just to tell the story. Number two, tell me what rule he broke by taking his own chair that he brought with his own effort and his own expense into a match that had no rules. What rule did he break? And he pinned Braun. A lot of you already don't like him anyways. So that's not a reason to hate him. And when it got to the point where it was time to pin him, like I saw, I think it was uh, Kev Castle said, he said, count bitch. No, he said, count this. He understood the significance and importance of the moment, and he wanted to make sure that his coworker, the referee, was in the right position and did the right thing and followed the game plan. That's not hateable. That's looking out for his fellow man. Again, you tell me what is heel about this Roman Reigns. The Roman Reigns of the past where he was the obstacle. Totally agree. This Roman Reigns, like this is the baby face we've been looking for for years. And if that doesn't convince you, well, think about it like this. What time did that show end last night? He respected the fans' time enough to wrap that shit up early. That old pay-per-view took like two and a half hours. If that's not a reason to cheer the man, then I don't know what the hell is, but most importantly of all, beyond the following rules of the match, protecting and looking out for his co-workers, following the rules of the match, bringing his own weapon to the event to save the company money, legitimately pinning somebody one, two, three in the middle of the ring with no shortcuts. When all is said and done, he respected your time and kept it short, and he did exactly what the t-shirt said. Wreck everyone and leave. That's exactly what he did. No false pretenses, no false promises, no BS, no bullshit. Everything that he said he was going to do, he did on Sunday night. And as has been so eloquently explained by yours truly, these are the reasons that Roman Reigns is a hero. Not to be hated. He is a baby face. Not the villain. And I realize I may be ahead on the curve on this. Well, we certainly know after almost a decade, I wouldn't be the first time. But eventually you'll catch up too. And you'll realize that once again, I'm your prophet of righteousness. Your prophet of truth. You listen to these other ones of the world that have talked about this great heel turn. There's no heel turn. It's a face turn. Roman Reigns is not only the new top guy on SmackDown, he is, most importantly of all, the hero that you've all asked for, the hero that you all wanted, the hero that we need, and the hero that we deserve. And you can let me know in the comments what you thought about this payback show. And you can let me know just how much you agree with my totally accurate and right comments because at the end of the day, OTRS Central is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Go Roman! He's our new hero! New hero!